be seated. Amen. Y'all want to get that nap in this evening? I bet it was nice because I did not get one. My kids slept for two hours, and then we got home, and he was wide awake. So I did not get the nap. But we do have visitation this Tuesday night at 630. New Man Youth Rally leaves this Friday at 10 a.m., so please be here for that. We have no men's or ladies' fellowship this month. And then we got our family fun night coming up uh, April 30th at 4 p.m. So I think that's all the announcements I got this evening. Gentlemen, if you want to come take the offering up. Brother Mike Tomlin, how about you pray for the offering, please? Missions moment tonight. We have um, Jason and uh, Ellen Thomas, our missionaries to uh, Mexico, and uh, we have a, have a short. Um, well, we have a video that uh, he put together, and uh, we've been encouraging uh, brother Jason and Patrick. I've been encouraging and. And threatening and you know have been begging for them to s send us stuff uh, so that we can see who they are and what they're doing and and just uh, know how to pray for them and and uh, what the, what their situations are that <clears throat> and see it firsthand too so um, we're going to watch this little video for the Jason and Ellen Thomas, missionaries to Mexico. Hello, we are Jason and Ellen Thomas, and we have been married for 23 years, and for 20 of those years, we have been missionaries in Mexico. And currently, we're in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, where we are uh, presently with Iglesia Bautista Piedra Angular, which is Cornerstone Baptist Church. And we want to take a few moments for you to see our work here and see the ministry. Yeah. Today is Saturday, and normally we have a an evangelism class uh, before we go out uh, soul winning. So these are some of the ladies that have been taking the class for the past month and a half, and uh, we're just getting ready to go out uh, and knock on some doors. Each of these houses have people who are looking for hope, who are looking for answers. And sometimes we have the opportunity to talk to them personally about their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. We even go on the streets where they're selling their goods and we have the opportunity to give them hope. This is our weekly Bible study where we are helping young Christians and some older Christians to grow in their faith and to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a better way. We also meet with our young people once a month where we have some food and games, fun, Bible study, and we even get to teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ so they'll have a, a walk with him on their own. In 2014, Resurrection Baptist Church was started in the yard of a lady and now has grown to over a hundred people. After a few minutes of singing, we love to have a little bit of time to just fellowship with one another as we get ready for another song.
just like services that you're used to after the singing, there is preaching that inspires the saints and convicts the sinners. Now we are back at Cornerstone Baptist Church where we have our church services out in the garage. And this is our first missions conference. And the people were very excited to be there. We had both churches together and there was a lot of fellowship and we enjoyed uh, meeting all the different missionaries that came to the service. Uh, this is one of the families that is going to Argentina and we heard their uh, burden for the people over there. Just like missionaries from the States, these missionaries in Mexico, they have to go from church to church, raising their support and getting ready to go to the field. Not only are there missionaries going to the foreign field, but there are also families that are staying right in Mexico, reaching the forgotten peoples around the country. This is a, a family that's from the state of Chiapas, reaching people in the city and villages. It was an honor and privilege to have Brother Jonathan and Sister Rachel Lyons with us during the missions conference. We heard some great preaching on missions and faith promise giving. Please pray that Cornerstone Baptist Church will continue to be built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ.
heard that, say amen. Let's turn to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4 tonight. My wife said today, she said, you were joking about preaching an hour this morning, and then you preached an hour this morning. I did not intend on preaching. I didn't even pay no attention to the clock, so I didn't have any intention on preaching no hour, but <laughs> it just happened that way, amen. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully y'all won't hold it against me, but y'all know how us preachers, we just lie, we just lie. <laughs> And uh, the truth is not in us. Amen. First uh, John chapter number 4. I want to say thank you for coming back tonight. I'm, <clears throat> I know a lot of folks have family things going on and things like that. I was hoping uh, I was hoping a lot of our folks would be back uh, tonight to hear, hear this message. And, uh, uh, but maybe, maybe we can preach it another time or uh, maybe even Wednesday night. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But. Uh, I was hoping our people would be here, uh, more of our people would be here, but I do understand uh, things with family and things like that. So uh, I do want to thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful and uh, being here tonight. Amen. First John chapter number four, I will confess that this, this message is borrowed. Amen. The Bible does say that there's nothing new under the sun. So uh, I'm not above stealing a preacher's message and preaching it. I'll do it in a heartbeat. And uh, that's what I'm doing tonight, amen. Uh, this is bro- one of Brother Tim Shirley's messages. And uh, I-, I contacted him a, a couple weeks ago and uh, was just asking him some thoughts about it. Because sometimes when I- I'll hear a message and uh, I have the same kind of thought, but I'll, a lot of times I'll sit down and I'll work out my own points and my own illiterate. But I just stole his full. He said, I'll just send you my notes, brother. <laughs> and so... Uh, uh, I'm going to try, I, I prayed, I said, Lord, let me preach it as you would have me to preach it. I don't want to preach it like him, uh, although he is a phenomenal preacher. He's a good preacher, God's man, uh, but I don't want to preach it like him because he he preached it uh, like like he should to his people, amen, and I want to preach it like I should to ours. And so I asked uh, that you would pray for me tonight as we, uh, as we uh, get into this. 1 John chapter number 4. The title of the message is Unity unity Between the Pulpit and the Pew. Unity Between the Pulpit and the Pew. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but the Bible says for us to try the spirits, whether they, be, uh, whether they are of God, because there are many false prophets... It says there are many false prophets are gone out into the world. Would you agree with that? Amen. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. Would you agree with that? Amen. I'm going to read it again. Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth, That Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Amen. What he's saying right there is simply this. That we as, that that we, uh, anyone that confesses and preaches Jesus Christ is of God. Amen. He's talking about the spirits. Talking about trying the spirits. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We see here that 
uh, God, as we see here in this passage of Scripture that we as believers, we as Christians, are given the authority and given the ability to try the spirits. Amen? Would you agree? We're given you as a congregation, you the, uh, those of you that sit in the pews are given the ability and you're given the knowledge and you're given uh, the discernment uh, to try the Spirit. Amen. Uh, whether it be of God or whether it be of the world. And here he gives a simple direction and a simple plan to know what is of God and what is of the world. He that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh that He's the Son of God, that He died for our sins, and that He rose again on the third day, that is the Spirit of God. But those that, that are the Spirit of the flesh, uh, and the Spirit of the world, they do not confess that Jesus Christ is God, but, but rather they uplift themselves, and they uplift their own ministry or their own, uh, their own benefit. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, today there's many preachers, many evangelists that travel around today and go around today and preach to their congregation, uh, and they uplift themselves. They put themselves on some kind of pedestal. They put themselves, they, they uplift their ministry. It's about me. It's about my ministry. It's about what I'm doing for uh, the good for people. What am I doing to reach people? But it rather, uh, I, I, but the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God is, is, is one, uh, that somebody uh, preaches that Jesus Christ is God and that He came and died for our sin and that we're nothing and He's everything. Amen. Would you agree with that? We see, first off, we see the connection to the pew. We see the connection to the pew. In chapter number 3, in verse number 2, it refers to us as the sons of God. In chapter number 4, in verse number 4, it refers to us as the little children. And we know that in chapter number 5, in verse number 4, the Bible says, For whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we know that we are the children of God because we are born, uh, born again. We're born into the family of God. And I have no problem whatsoever uh, for the, the Bible referring to me as a son of God or as one of His little children. Amen. And we know that we know that we are beloved in chapter number 5, uh, that we believeth in Him. We know that we are a part of the family of God by definition because we are the sons of God, because we believe, just like I read in chapter number 4, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and we've accepted that truth. So would you agree with me tonight that that is truth? Would you agree with me tonight that Jesus Christ coming to flesh to die for our sin is truth? Would you agree that that's truth? Would you agree that's what the Bible teaches? Would you agree that that's what's right? Amen. So do I. Amen. So there we see there is a connection there between me, between this pulpit, and between you, uh, the congregation, those of you that sit in the pew, there's a connection. We do come to an agreement tonight that Jesus Christ was has died, came to the flesh, and died for our sin. Amen. There's a connection there. We have that connection. We see there is a concern coming from John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. He says, to try the spirits. What he's simply saying here is be careful about the Spirit. Be careful, watch out for the spirits that are coming from the pulpit. What kind of spirit is it? Is it a spirit of pride? Is it a spirit of a hireling, someone that does it just for the money? Is it a spirit of someone that is uh, in it for the popularity? Is it... The spirit of someone that is in it for the fame. He gives you, you the listener, the ability 
And He gives you the right and He gives you the discernment to determine the spirits from behind the pulpit. He's given you that. Amen. How many, how many times, unfortunately, and you can raise your hand tonight, and hopefully it's not me, but how many times have you listened to a preacher and thought, ah, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. And listen, there's been men of God that I hold to high esteem, men that I respect and men that I love and men that I uh, honor and that I will always honor and have respect for. But there's been times, there's been some times, very rarely, but there have been times where I've heard them stand in a pulpit and say something and it just, and I just think, well, I don't know about that. I myself have been given the ability and the authority based on Scripture to try that spirit. Whether it be of God or whether it be of the world. Would you agree? There's a concern. He said to try it. He said, believe not every spirit. Because, simply because, not all of them are of God. Amen? And we do know that everybody that says they're of God aren't of God. Matthew, Matthew 24, I believe it is, teaches us that everybody that confesses is not of God. Amen? We know that simply because we see a prime example. Judas followed God, walked with God, did the work of God, but yet he was not of God. And so because we know that there are men out there and women out there that have the ability and the talent to look like they are of God are not always of God. They're not, they don't have the right spirit. Here's another example. How many times have those of you that are soul winners, how many times have you ever had somebody and you've been soul winning, you've been talking to them, and they tell you they're saved, and they tell you they're born again, and you ask them to tell you, okay, how? And they tell you, and there's something in there that just don't sound right. And you're like, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that you're not the Holy Spirit? But we're going to get into something here in a minute. But we're not the Holy Spirit, but we have the Holy Spirit. And, there, and we're given the authority, again, in, in 1 John, to know what the spirits are of, whether they be of the world or whether they be of God. So if somebody is sitting there and they're telling us, yeah, I got saved because one time when I was little, we went down to the creek and, and my preacher baptized me and I signed a card and now I know that I'm going to heaven. And there's something inside of you that says, well, first off, that's not scriptural. Second of all, second off, I just don't bear witness with that spirit. Amen. How many of y'all have ever been around somebody that you just don't bear witness with their spirit? There's always a conflict. The spirit is always wrong. It's always off. How many of you, how many of you have been with someone that your spirit does bear witness with them? You have a kindred spirit. You can talk to each other and you, and you can agree and you can, you can fellowship together and you have that kindred spirit together. It's because the Bible tells us that we can and we do have the ability and discernment and the authority to try the Spirit. We see that concern. But we, first off, we see the connection to the pew. Now let's look at the connection to the preacher. Verse 1, there's false prophets. We need to know what is the Spirit. What is he trying to say? What is he trying to do? Verse 5. 
They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. And the world heareth them. But in verse 6 it says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth who? Us. It goes from heareth them to us. And listen to me. He's saying right there because there's fellowship together. There's an, an agreement. There's unity together. There ought to be a connection between you, the pew, and I, the preacher. Amen? You ought to be able to sit and listen to your preacher, your pastor, and have a kindred spirit together. Now, hold on a second. There's going to be things in Scripture that I say to you that you may not like. Amen? How do you know, preacher? Because there's things in Scripture that when I read it, it busts my hide. Amen? And there's things that when I sit down in a pew and there's a preacher in a pulpit and he's preaching to me, I fall under conviction about some of the things he said. But that don't mean he's not of the right spirit. Brother Daryl Cox put me under conviction. The Holy Spirit is preaching. Why? You need to be a better soul winner. You need to go out there and get them. Go after it. Get, get, Get up, get going, go win souls. I called him yesterday, pouring down rain. I could hear his, I could hear him in his truck. I said, "What are you doing, preacher?" He said, "Well, I'm out on visitation. I'm on bus visitation, knocking on doors." He said, "I'm soaking wet, preacher." And I fell under conviction in my office. I'm thinking, "Well, shoot fire! I'm gonna go win. I'm gonna go win souls. I'm gonna go knock on doors. <laughs> what am I doing here?" Sitting inside. But when he preaches and he gets up there with an authority to say those things. And listen to me. I can be convicted and I can hear what he's saying. And God can work on the inside of me. But that doesn't mean he's of the wrong spirit. Now, he can say those things in the wrong spirit. He could try to use that opportunity to try to beat us up with that, but I don't believe that's what he did. He did it with a spirit of love and a heart of love and compassion. And I ask you, when you sit in the pews and hear myself preach, is there a spirit of unity And I ask you this because the Bible tells that boy's got some hiccups. Would y'all feed that boy? And I ask you this because because we're told to ask ourselves this, to try the Spirit. As much as I would hate to say this to you because, you know what? Sometimes the answer might be, preacher, I don't really like you. But you know what the Bible says for you to try the Spirit. And there's no way around that for me. That is your opportunity to try my Spirit. But on the flip side of the coin, I'm to try your spirit. Whether it be of God or whether it be of the world. You know, when we when we preach, at least those preachers and, and I and I, I I like to say that I'm one of the preachers of the Spirit of God. I I hope I'm not one of the world. At least I don't believe I am. 
And because of that, when we preach and we, we say things and we use the scripture to shed light on a situation in someone's life, it's out of love. And it's so that, so that situation could be fixed or made better through the scripture. Now I've seen some and heard of some that when they deal with tithing, they deal with it differently. They'll, they'll try to embarrass a member. I don't think that's right. I just don't think that's the way to go about it. It's not my it's not my duty to guilt you into wanting to win souls. It's not my duty to guilt you into coming to visitation. It's not my duty to try to guilt you into coming back Wednesday night, Sunday night, Sunday school. It's not my duty to try to stand here and use my words and use my my words to try to guilt you into doing the right thing. But now if I, that would be me of the wrong spirit. But now if I say things out of scripture, I, I believe based on 1 John chapter 4, if I use scripture to preach these things to you, I believe that's of the right spirit. So there needs to be a connection to the preacher. We see the concern when it re, in regards to the connection to the pew. We see the connection to the preacher. We see that we see the confession. Verses chapter four, verses two and three. My message ought to be based on chapter four, verses two and three. My message ought to be that we are nothing. And he is everything. My message should not be let's build this church so that I can build my name. Let's not, let's, let's build this church, let's win souls so that people can say that Jesse Bragg, the pastor of Grace Baptist Church, has the largest Sunday school in America. And if that happens, praise the Lord, that's awesome. But it should not be the motive behind which uh, the reason to why I preach to you and I, and, I, and I try to motivate you through the scripture to do the right thing. So that people can point the finger at us and say, look what a preacher, look what a pastor he is. It should be solely on the fact that, hey, we're nothing around here, but Jesus is everything. We don't mean anything, but he means everything. I'm nothing, he's everything. Don't look at me, don't follow me, follow him. Amen. My job is to not stand here and be on a pedestal, but it's to rather point you to the cross uh, so that you can follow him, so that you, listen, because if you're basing your Christianity off of me, you're going to fail. Because I'm going to fail. Because I'm a failure. Because He is everything. I'm putting my faith and my trust and my abilities in Him. Because alone I have none. I have no ability. I'm not a good public speaker. I don't even like public. I like solitude. I do well alone. Amen. Amen. I could sit for hours, hours in a tree stand and not speak to another human being and be just fine. Amen. I can sit on a lake with a rod and reel next to nobody and be just fine. But God has called me to pastor and he's called me to preach and he's called me to minister to the believers. Even so much in John 14, I believe it is, Brother Benny, if I'm right, 14 or 4, I'm, I'm even to the point of where I'm not even to be so good that I couldn't even kneel down and wash your feet. 
just like Jesus did. That sh I should be willing to, to, to kneel down and humble myself. And don't worry, I'm not going to, but I've kicked around the idea. Brother Eddie, have I not? We talked about it. I said, I'm going to wash feet around here. He said, we can talk. I said, if I didn't think he'd freak somebody out, I'd wash some feet. I've called preachers everywhere. I've called Brother Mark. Brother Mark said, I think you'll do it some more. I, think you just, I just think he just need to leave you so he'll do it. To show my humility. Why? Because I'm nothing. Because I carry the title of pastor doesn't mean anything. But now I believe the position in the title should have respect. I, I, I just, not because I am, but because I, that's just the way I was brought up. The Bible teaches that it's worthy of double honor. The confession, my confession to you is that I'm nothing. And he's everything. And you should be able to try my spirit and see that if what I'm saying is accurate. Do I endorse humanity? Do I lift up humanity? Because God, he degrades humanity. He tells me that my righteousness is filthy rags, meaning, who are you? What is your, you have no good, you have no good in you except for my son. But there are preachers out there today who want to tell you that you're a good person. And that you're just, you're such a, you're such a good person and there's good in you and you, you know, just be uplifted. And no, that's, that's garbage, church, because because in my own strength and in my own ability, the farthest I would get would be hell. Amen? That's my confession. But again, on the flip side of the coin, you should have the same. You see the confession? Confession of the people. You have the ability to identify the Spirit. You know, when it talks about that itching, teachers, and, the, and having those itching ears. You know, I, I never thought about this until today when I heard Brother Tim talking about it. He said this. He said, you ever see somebody with an itch in their ear? And they're digging at that thing like life depended on it. You know? My wife makes fun of me because I use Q-tips. And I'll, I'll be working that thing, man. Like I'll be in another planet just like working that ear. You know what that is, that itch in there? You, you ever had one? I, I, I told, We were at camp last summer, the teen camp. And I came, I, I came out of the shower, I was dressed everything. I went down the hall, I told Caleb, I said, I'd give a million dollars for a Q-tip. I said, I ain't had a Q-tip all week. Now, I'm the type, I'll use a Q-tip three or four times a day. If I see one laying, all right. A little confession moment with y'all. And, and, and Brother Caleb said, I got you, man. I was like, whatever you want, rest of the week, I got your back. But I never thought that itching represents like a like you're being tormented tormented by the truth tormented by truth and they're looking for something to soothe that torment from the truth that itch they've heard the truth it's been put in them and they can't get away from it and they don't want to hear it they don't want to take heed to it they don't want to they don't want to apply it so they try to find somebody else 
they try to find another preacher, another church that's going to soothe that torment. The truth is that we need Jesus. He is the good one, not us. My question to you is, do you magnify the Savior? Or do you magnify the world? We're to try the spirits. Whether they be of the world or whether they be of God. I'm almost done. We see the confession in power. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. Amen, I'm saved. Now if you're saved, you're full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not this magical moment that takes place that falls down a second, a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't when you're when you get saved, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. You have the Holy Spirit in you. I have the Holy Spirit in me. Let me tell you what happens. So when you when I have the Holy Spirit in me, and you have the Holy Spirit in you, and there's a moment. A lot like we experienced this morning when I got to that point about the folded cloth. It was getting a little fired up. Amen. I got fired up. Some of you got fired up. And your your spirit began to bear witness with my spirit. And it was kind of like a volley back and forth between the preacher and the pew. And the preacher and the pew. And the louder I got, the louder some of you got. And the louder some of you got, the louder I got. Amen. And we began to go back and forth and back and forth. And listen, I've been in services before where the preacher was absolutely losing his mind. And listen, he was full of the Holy Spirit. And he was preaching with power, preaching with unction. And the church was with him. And they were shouting and they were praising the Lord. And there was unity back and forth. But you know what happens, why it's important to have that? Because those that do not have the Holy Spirit are sitting here thinking, I want what they got. Because when that Holy Spirit begins to reveal itself in me, and that Holy Spirit begins to reveal itself in you as you're sitting there, and back and forth and back and forth we go, You're amening, and I'm hollering, and we're hollering, and you're hollering, and I'm hollering. And I'm shouting, and you're shouting. And I'm crying, and you're crying, and we're just crying together, and we're just worshiping God. Back and forth together we go. And we have a testimony service. Brother Jeremy testifies, and Brother Todd wants to testify, and then Brother Austin Feels the need to testify. Then Brother Christopher needs to testify. Then Brother Benny and Miss Debbie want to testify. And before you know it, it's, it's one after the other, back and forth and back and forth. And there's a witness and there's a unity together in the spirit between the pulpit and the pews. It's important because there's somebody sitting there thinking, I wonder why they're crying. I wonder why she's shouting. I wonder why he's on the altar. I wonder why her hands are raised. When I was a young boy, Miss Vernie, I swear she's 180 years old. With a name like Vernie, you know she's old. And she would sit on the second pew in the middle. And she had the whitest hair. So white it was almost blue. Might have been. She done permed it to death. And she was about this tall. Her husband had done gone home to be with the Lord. She lived by herself. No joke, she was in her 90s. And there's a picture. And when I, was a, when I was a boy, I used to sit and watch her and I would think she would stand up. She would grab the back of the pew and she would stand up. And she would lift her little arthritic hands like this. 
And as the older she got, her granddaughter would sit by her and she would help her and hold her. And Miss Vernie would just hold her hand. And there's a picture of when we came back from teen camp after I got saved. I used to remember thinking, I wonder what she's doing. I wonder why she's doing that. It makes no sense to me. It seems silly, almost comical. As a young boy, it was funny. Didn't understand. But the other day, I was looking through some pictures, and in the teen choir, I was standing up there singing, and she's standing there with her hands like this. And my hand was raised, and her hands were raised, and I got to thinking, man, now I know what she's talking about. Now I understand why she was raising her hands. Now I understand why she used to stand and worship the Lord and praise the Lord. Is because there was unity. It's because our spirits were bearing witness with each other. Because we know that we're nothing and He's everything. There's power. But lastly, in verse number 6, we see the confirmation. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. And he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know the confirmation. Know we the spirit of truth. And the truth of error. We have the right to determine the spirit. The preacher, does he have the spirit of God or does he have the spirit of error? Does the pew have the spirit of God or the spirit of error? Do I lift up myself? Do I edify myself or do I lift up God? Do you edify yourself? Or do you edify God? The question is this. See what happens. What I believe has happened today in our churches. Is there's no unity. Between the pulpit and the pew. And that's why people come in one way. And they leave the very same way. Because there's people that are sitting there. Arms crossed, mad at the preacher. And the preacher's preaching, mad at the pew. And instead of hurling praise and worship back and forth, they're hurling darts and arrows back and forth. And we, listen to me, Grace Baptist Church, we will not build a church. We will not thrive if we don't have unity between the pew and the pulpit. And I say this from the bottom of my heart, and this is not false humility. And this is not me... Saying that I want to go anywhere because I've said it a million times. I want to die here. And I mean that. I'm not just saying that. But if you can't have unity with me. You need to have a preacher that you can. You need a pastor that you can get behind. And you can support. And you can push and you can love and you can pray for. Not one that you have discord with. Not one that you are always at him and he's always at you. You say, preacher, do you think that's happening here? No, I don't. I think there has been some, truthfully. There's been some. But if we're going to grow, We're going to see God do big things. And we're going to see people saved. We're going to have to have unity between the pulpit and the pew. Amen. 
And it all needs to be based solely on Scripture. 100%. Everything that I say and how you respond needs to be based out of this book. We need to conduct ourselves out of this Bible. Conduct the work of the church out of this Bible. Win souls out of this Bible. Disciple out of this Bible. Marry people out of this Bible. Bury people out of this Bible. Everything we need to do needs to be out of this book. Because I'm nothing. And I have no philosophies of my own. It would be a real long time for y'all to see me write a book. Because I don't have any theories. I'm not knocking these guys that write books. I'm thankful for them. I got a million of them. But I, I don't, I don't, I'm talking about me. I don't have any theories. I don't have any good ideas. Except let's go fishing. That's a good idea. Let's go shoot something. That's a good idea. But as far as growing a church, I just gotta, I just gotta, I've gotta. I've got to read this book and I've got to glean from those who have gone before me that I know did it the right way. That's all I got. And we've got to have that together. So let me drive this home and I'm done. Ready? There's been times that I've had men come to me and correct me. Or maybe not correct, but give me ideas. Give me their thought. And I can't get mad. They're trying to help. But it needs to be vice versa. If I come to you and I try to give biblical sound advice, it ought to be taken the right way. Let's all stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you this question. We're going to play one, just one couple lines of a song. Short invitation. If you don't come, you don't come. Let me ask you this question. Has there been here? Maybe you're a visitor. Maybe you don't even come here all the time. I don't know. But has there been unity between the pulpit and the pew? In your own heart, nobody's looking, nobody's watching. If you come tonight, I'm not going to think, oh, he's been mad at me, she's been mad at me. I'm not going to think that. But in your heart, has there been unity between the pulpit and the pew? As she plays, as he plays, won't you come? Won't you come? There's some you need to come and say, Lord, I. Maybe you need to come and say, Lord, help me to have the right spirit when it comes to the preacher. Help me to have the right spirit when it comes to service. Help me to have the right spirit when it comes to living for God. That I'm nothing, He's everything.
headed out for youth rally thir- Friday. Friday? Friday Friday morning, 10 o'clock. Friday morning, 10 o'clock. All right, let's get some J dollars. Go get J. All right, if you're watching this video, you've just watched one of our services here at Grace Baptist Church, and our number one desire is to see sinners come to know the Lord as their Savior. And uh, I'll read something from the Bible here in 1 John chapter number 5. Verse number 13, the Bible says that these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is what I like, the most important part, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And that's our number one goal at Grace Baptist Church is for people to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they have eternal life through Jesus Christ. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, verse number 8 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, that's that's a, to me, those two verses are two of my most favorite verses in the Bible because it's, it's a simple plan. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? That we put our faith and our trust in that gift, and that's the gift of Jesus Christ from God to this world. Uh, You know, the only way that we could go to heaven um, is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way uh, to have uh, access to heaven is through accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Uh, you know, a lot of people are mistaken today and they think that, uh, you know, being a good person, attending church or maybe even tithing or giving money to the church uh, uh, gains them access to heaven. But in reality, uh, the only way that we can have access to heaven is through Jesus Christ, the door. And he is the only way. He said, I am the way. And uh, and I want to invite you today that if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would ask that you would take this time to bow your head and, 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 and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart and pray a simple prayer. I'm not, I'm not going to give you the exact words to pray. It's, it's a prayer between you and the Lord. But I would say that you would just model the prayer after this. Lord, I'm a sinner. And I realize that without you, I have no access into heaven. Without you, I have no way uh, to forgive my sins. And Lord, I invite you to come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and become my Savior. If you would pray something similar to that and mean it from the bottom of your heart and have full faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he'll do that. He said that he would. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And if you do that today, we would love to hear from you. If you would, just send a message to our church Facebook page, call us or send us an email, and we'd love to have the feedback and know that someone accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. If we can do anything for you here at Grace Baptist Church as far as prayer or whatever, just give us a call. Reach out to us. Let us know. If you have any questions about salvation, you can always call our office or reach out to us online, and we'll be glad to help you with that. Thank you. God bless.